Welcome to Magnify Church Rockford. We are glad that you are here. If you're watching online, we're glad you're with us as well. Why don't you stand to your feet? We're going to sing about the greatness of our God. It's amazing to think that the same God that put Adam and Eve in the garden is the same God we're dealing with. He is yesterday, today, and forever. He's awesome. Let's sing about the greatness of our God. dawn of creation this world has been crying out for hope for a hero to save us we long for the supernatural but there is only one God to save the day so clear the stage prepare the way as heaven and earth are singing Glory, hallelujah, let the whole world see the greatness of our God in awesome wonder. There's no one above Him, only our Savior wears the crown. There's none who can stop Him, not even the grave can hold Him down. But there is only one King who can save the day, so clear the stage, prepare the way, because heaven and earth are singing. Glory, hallelujah, let the whole world see the greatness of our God in awesome wonder. We know forever, we know the greatness of our God. His power is endless, He lives within us. We know the greatness of our He provided a way for us to be rescued from ourselves, from our sin, from our brokenness, so we can live each day by His grace and His hope. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is 
written, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven, the King of kings called. Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion. Let the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim. with us. Deep 
Father, we come before you, and this song is an extension of our prayer. Help us to abide, that we are so dependent on you, that in the midst of our brokenness and our sin, when we feel as though we are unable, that we are not good enough to come before you, there's too much of a gap, there's too much distance, there's too much sin. Father, you come running after us. Help us to abide in you, Lord. We want to lift up all of those who are experiencing pain, hurt, people who have lost loved ones, people who have gotten tough diagnosis and who are experiencing things for the first time. Lord, you are a comforter come alongside, help them to experience you in new ways where they know that you love them, that you are close, and you care for us. Father, thank you for all of our missionaries as you have planted them specifically right where they want them to be, that they can further your kingdom and your message that Christ loves them. So Father, be with us in the rest of our morning this morning. Praise in your heavenly name. Amen. You guys can take a seat. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Magnify.
Very glad that you have joined us here this morning. Whether you're here in this room or you're joining us online, we're very thankful that you're here this morning. My name is Trevor, and I am part of our high school team here at Rockford. And this past weekend, I was able to enjoy uh, some time with my son. And so my wife Allison and I, we have a two-year-old at home, which is always fun. Always. But each Friday, I get to spend the entire day with this little man, and I love that. And so on Friday, we were taking some errands, we were doing some things, and I said, I want to have a little special treat for Oliver at the end of the day, where him and I are going to have a donut together. This is a big deal. And so we pull into the donut shop after our errands. I look in the rearview mirror, and I say, hey, Ollie, do you want a donut? Expecting just his eyes to go wide with excitement and just adoration for his loving father. He then says, no, fruit snacks, which is his version of fruit snacks. And I had to disappoint him and say, I'm sorry, we don't have fruit snacks, but I can get you a donut, trying to redirect. He then doubles in volume and says, no, fruit snacks. It just went downhill from there. I'm reminded that this is so often me and how I relate to my Heavenly Father. He is someone who has good gifts for me, and yet I get in my own way of experiencing the love that he has for me. That's why I'm so thankful for this place. I need this place. I need these people. I need the Spirit in me to pull me out of myself to enjoy the love of my Father. We want to remind you that we have a cool opportunity for you guys at our Ensley campus where we're going to be having a financial planning ministry. If you have an opportunity to get a will, a trust, a power of attorney, or a medical power of attorney, all of those documents can be made professionally for you for free. And so that's something you are interested in. Please go to our website, check these things out, and register so we can come alongside you in this. Each and every week, we are so thankful that we get to partner with you in our giving. Faithfully generously. You guys come alongside and we get to do great things for this place and our community. If you are looking to find more information about our giving, please go to our website at magnifychurch.org slash give. Thank you. Enjoy our morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be able to have you all joining us together to worship, to pray, and now to sit under the word together. My name is Trent Heaton. I greet the great joy of leading our men's groups and uh, life groups here at Magnify. And now is a busy season. A lot of activity going on in the church, and the same is included here uh, in the men's and life groups. Uh, we have new f- groups forming up. We have a lot of people joining in, and I would love to invite you into that uh, part of our community that intentionally walks together to be able to follow after Jesus. Uh, I'll say more about that later on, but um, I am just so excited for this time of year, all the way from kindergarten, all the way through those who still think they're in kindergarten, uh, and everyone in between. Uh, we have have groups uh, going for everyone, and so we just want to invite you into that, and me especially being the guy that gets to work alongside uh, men and women who are doing such a good job loving people well. And so uh, I'm excited to be able to uh, continue uh, week two in our series, In Significant Moments. 
Uh, this is a series we're going through the book of James together. And last week, Pastor Sue Quackbush let us off uh, in starting with the text. And so I'm excited to continue this because there's so many uh, good things to hang on to throughout this passage of things that we can kind of take in and just like, okay, here's a way I can live out my faith. Here's how I can do this. James is a great book of hows, uh, but if we don't understand the why, I feel like we will miss a lot. And so I uh, think James has a lot for us to unpack and uncover together today. I'm very excited to get to do that. Um, in the midst of all that, I also want to recognize that fact that <clears throat> since last weekend, if you, if you were here and got to sit under the word together and we were encouraged in good, in good ways to count it all joy whenever we face trials of many kinds, I want to recognize that that verse last week might have meant something different to you than it does right now. <clears throat> Life changes fast. And so if you're here, I'm so thankful. Whether you're joining us online or you're in person, if you're feeling the weight, carrying the weight of those trials, you're in a good place to be. I think the God of the universe has some wonderful news for us this morning together. So I'd love to invite you to open up to James 1 together, if you could, please. And as you do, I'm going to just pray for us. Father God, thank you for this time. God, help me to get out of the way of the truth of living water that you want to pour out to the men and women here. Please uh, let your word speak loudly and me to be quiet. And like it says in Hebrews 4, may this word bear down on us with its weight so that it can pierce our hearts and know us so that as we read it, we can be transformed to be like your son. Thank you, Lord, that we get to do this together. In Jesus' name, amen. So this uh, text that we're going to be covering in James is going to be starting in verse 19, but there's really a handful of conversations happening within this text. Uh, the first chunk uh, is talking about the speed of life. The second one's going to be about mirrors, and the third will be about religion. And so we're going to start with that first one, the speed of life, verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers, let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. <clears throat> Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. How much of our lives these days is just bent toward more, faster, do it quicker. Come on, get it, hurry, hurry up, let's go. Let's cram more into it. How can we do this more? How can we do this faster? So much, so much of our world is bent toward that. Uh, we are hearing lots of stories lately about the power of artificial intelligence and AI and how that can uh, bless us as people and make, take jobs that are gonna be uh, boring and make them amazing because it'll help us do things so much faster. And if you're like me, you're like, no, I've, I've seen the movies, man. This does not end well. <laughs> I don't care how fast things are. Or uh, iPhone 15, right? They just released, making a release announcement about that and Apple uh, coming out with yet another one of their iPhones. And it just seems like every time it's like, you could have probably taken all the computing power and all the technological power of Hollywood studios 30 years ago and now you're carrying it around in your pocket. It's just amazing the speed at which this world is getting us to try to go at in your workplaces, at home, in schools. It's, man, if we did it in an hour yesterday, can we do it in one minute today? Could we make it faster? We need it. And anything, anything that's remotely uncomfortable, awkward, challenging, or just kind of has a whiff of suffering to it, it's like, what do we got to do to get rid of this? What must we do? So news articles now, they include little timelines of how long it should take the average reader to read. They're far shorter than they used to be. Our videos like TikTok and YouTube are like 30, 60 seconds long. Social media is like built to get you emotionally charged up so that you'll be engaged on the computer, so that you'll stay there, so you'll return there, so that you'll spend money there. And this whole world is just like spinning. I don't know if you feel it. I feel it. I've got uh, kids that are growing up. I've got a teenager now. And it just feels like that wheel is just spinning faster and faster and faster. And it feels hard to catch up. 
Make sure your kids sign up for this. Don't miss out on that. Do this. And in the face of all of that, for us today, we have a brother writing us a letter from 2,000 years ago that says, slow down, slow down. The only thing we should be quick to do is listen. Imagine, just imagine for a minute what Facebook would be like if we lived to this, right? Like if people genuinely like, you know, I think I'm just gonna set my phone aside. I'm gonna really contemplate and pray, do my research, seek to understand. And then maybe in a few days, I'll come back and I'll, I'll respond. <laughs> no, right? Like it's like they have buttons that are like immediately engaged. Respond, duh, just come on, give us your emotion. Like that's what it's all built around and designed to do. You can almost hear the billions of dollars lost and Mark Zuckerberg just pff, spitting out his coffee at the thought of collectively people doing this together. James, our affectionate brother who loves the 12 tribes of the dispersion, sending out this letter to them and threw them to us saying, slow down, slow down. This is the way of Christ. When we look to Christ's life, we can see tons of examples of this, but I think when we are being honest about our own, <laughs> not so much. So if this is the way of Christ, it's kind of like, I mean, there's parts of it that are like, man, that sounds kind of easy. Like, okay, I'll just say less, I'll listen more, and I won't be as angry as I was yesterday, maybe. Now, I can't be sure of this. I don't know about you, but I've, I've heard some statistics like something like eight or uh, 11 out of eight scientists believe that 98% of all humanity's problems would be resolved if we just did this. <laughs> Obviously, I'm kidding, you know, but it doesn't take much to stretch our imagination to get to the, us in the place to go, yes, my life would be better. Even if you didn't follow Jesus, my life would be so much better had I instead of spouting off my opinion, I just chose to listen. How many of us in this room already this morning said something as soon as it came out of your mouth, you're like, please come back. You wish you hadn't said it. Or you were sitting down with a friend over a cup of coffee and you just talked and you talked and you talked and you talked and you laughed and you realized you didn't, you didn't hear a single thing that person said. Or how many of us are just walking around in an 8.5 on the Richter scale of our heart's emotions and all it just takes is one person bumping into us, cutting us off on the road, or stepping on a Lego piece, and then boom, the top goes, and instantly the world's gonna know how angry you are. How many of us are carrying around the pain of not living this way? And in light of that, James says, God's best for us, Jesus' way, is that we would, be, we would slow down. Pastor and author John Ortberg, <clears throat> in his book, The Life You've Always Wanted, Spiritual Disciplines for Ordinary People, he writes this, love and hurry are fundamentally incompatible. Love always takes time, and time is the one thing hurried people do not have. Hurry is the great enemy of your spiritual life in our day. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. So in other words, Christ's best for us is to slow down our speed of life so that we are not missing each other. Three conversations. Conversation one, about the speed of life. Conversation two is about mirrors. Verse 22 but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks, at his, looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who listens, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. How many of us uh, have uh, had conversations where 
uh, maybe even in the atrium this morning, you walked up and you go to meet somebody new and you're doing the introduction. You say, hey, my name's Trent. How you doing? What's your name? And you're, you're, they're like, hey, we, we've met. So I've been like five times now. And you're like, oh man, and you're feeling bad. And so your mind's just racing with names like Tom, Tim, Tom, Tom, Tony, no, Tony, it's Tony, it's Tony. And you're like midway through that conversation, you're having to have that walk of shame. And you're like, I'm so sorry. What was your name again? And you're like, it's Sarah. <clears throat> and you're just like, you just missed it, right? Something important something you should have known that you've seen a bunch of times, but you just missed. Or, or you're at home and you got your keys in your pocket and you just set it down on your phone, you set it somewhere. I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes you just walk about and then minutes later, you're like, oh man, where, where'd I put that? Forget, you, something important that you had forgotten uh, my sister-in-law, she has this habit when she goes over to our house and she brings something to have with dinner, uh, she'll take her leftovers to put in the fridge and she'll put her keys with the leftovers. So, so she doesn't forget. She doesn't want to forget that important thing. Sometimes we have weird habits to help us to remember these things. But is that what's going on here in James, this forgetfulness in the mirror? Is that what's happening? Someone who looks in the mirror and forgets? I think uh, this, this passage could be something that I think if we were to be slow to listen and quick to speak and quick to anger, I think this passage is something we could just blow right on by and just totally miss something that was really important that I think James is saying here about forgetfulness when it comes to looking into the mirror. Now put yourself in the shoes of this hypothetical as if you're this person where you're walking to a mirror you're going there, are you, you're not just like walking by and kind of glancing at this, you're, you're looking intently into it. Then you're going away, then you're forgetting. That is what it is like when we receive the words of God and do not act upon them. That's what James is saying. So let me ask you again, is that the kind of forgetting like, oops, can't find my keys. Oops, sorry, tell me your name again. I don't think that's what's going on here. I don't think that's what James has to say for us. I think for some of us, some of us is selective hearing where we get to things in the word or we hear something in a message and it's just hard either because it's just challenging to understand or frankly, it's just challenging our hearts in some way. And so what we decide to do with it is we just kind of tune that part out and we hear what we want to hear. I don't know about you guys, but I remember what it was like to be a teenager and sometimes it's like for the eighth, ninth, tenth time, mom has to tell you that thing, right? And you're like, oh, sorry, mom, I didn't hear you. It's like, oh. Selective hearing can happen in our hearts as we approach the word of God, where we block out what's hard and we just take what tastes good. For others of us, this can look like apathy and just not caring. It's like going up to it, looking at it intently, realizing there's something, but just saying, Nah, I don't care. It's not that important. Must not matter that much. Yeah, it probably doesn't mean what it says. Maybe that's you in one of those categories, but regardless of whether it's the first, the second, or some other, I think in every case, this forgetfulness isn't, oops, I forgot. I think this forgetfulness is a, no, and moving on with your life. I think we're actively rejecting God as we sit under the truth of his word, invited in relationship, given good news, and yet do not live in response to that. This is not a forgetfulness of missing something. This is a forgetfulness of saying no. This mirror, this mirror that's mentioned, a man who looks, this man is looking. Where is he looking? He's in a mirror. What is he trying to get us at? It's someone who looks into what? The perfect law, the law of liberty, the law that saves the law that brings freedom. What is this law? It's awesome. This law is the law of Christ. This law is the one that sets us free. It's the gospel. It's the good news that though the world was made perfect and though we as humans had everything we needed, and though we rejected God collectively as people through Adam and Eve, but also that we break each other's hearts each and every day and break relationship with each other and God, though we do that, good news. 
Good news, there is a perfect law of liberty that gives us something, gives us a gift. And that gift is grace and love through Jesus Christ. This is the perfect law we're called to look into. This is the perfect law we're supposed to look at with intent and to sit underneath it and remain there and hold it and let it speak to our lives. This is the good news. There's two people. There's someone who looks into the word of God, looks into the mirror, sits in church, listens to a sermon, listens to worship, sings along, and yet leaves and does not act upon what he's learned. And it's going to that mirror and saying, no. And there's another, a better way that Christ invites us all into, which is this, the good news, that we can follow along with him and that we do not need to be forgotten, but, or we do not need to forget, but rather we can step into the perfect law of life. He who looks, he who does, he who remains, and he who sits under this, he will be blessed in his doing. Three conversations, the speed of life, the mirror of the word, and religion. I want to humbly offer a slight correction here to a phrase I hear often. Well, but before I do that, let's, uh, let's read this text together now. The last piece, verse 26. If anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Like I said, I, I just want to kind of poke at something for a minute and just talk about it with you because I think I, I've heard it often here. I hear it often at other churches as well in different circles I roll with where we will say something to the effect of relationship over religion, relationship over religion, or God desires relationship with you, not religion, or, uh, you know, God just wants your heart, or, or you might even have said, yourself, I know I've said this myself, uh, I'm not a religious person, I, I, but I have a relationship with God, I love Jesus. And, and, I, and I think the good of that, the good behind that is, is true. God does want a relationship with you. He does want your heart. That is what he cares about. He wants you. He wants you to know you do not have to do better and try harder to find your way into the kingdom of heaven. That hopefully you can meet up to his standard through your efforts and somehow that you're gonna get enough points with the big guy upstairs to let you in. That is not, that, so in that way, yes, that, I, yes and amen, I, I love that. But let's take a look at this passage again, what it says. If anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. If we were to take the opposite of this, we're to see the, the religious is not the problem, is it? Because, there, because the opposite of this would be uh, if you were religious and you did bridle your tongue, you wouldn't be deceiving your heart and your religion would be worthwhile. So what's going on here? Uh, religion that is pure and undefiled. Before There's pure and undefiled religion? Well, well if God cares about my heart and he wants my relationship, then what, what is this about? Uh, the Greek word, uh, the, uh, religious in the Greek means God-fearing. And so... Um, the God fearers or in this context, because he's talking about Jesus followers, those who follow after Christ, those who would call themselves believers in Jesus Christ. If anyone thinks he's a God fearer, this person doesn't keep a bridle on their tongue. Their religion or their ceremonial expression of their God fearing or their systematic approach to God fearing or their routine and regular ways of following after Jesus, that would be worthless. And brothers and sisters, as we, as we think about the world that we're in right now and with so much, both inside the church and out, grasping for truth, grasping for definition of things to, to need some truth to hang on to, say, what's this all about? What's the meaning? What's the purpose? I think we just need to be really careful about how we speak of some of these things. Because I think to make religion out to be the bad guy is, is missing the point. The religion isn't the problem. If religion is not the problem, then what is? When we just cannot, when we, through our anger, decide to talk about other people, 
behind their backs, when we just can't hold our opinion in because we have to be right, when we do not realize the weight of our words to our children, that's the problem. Uh, When we refuse to look after those who do not have anyone looking out for them, the widows, the orphans, the aliens, the immigrants, the refugees, the sick, the wounded, when we refuse to go to the addict and care for them, that religion is worthless. When we get so mixed up and so okay with being in the world but not of it and we just blur that line to the point where we are so intermixed and our roots are just connected in with the world and you cannot tell the difference functionally between our life and someone not following Jesus, that is the problem. That is the issue. And so our collective way that we meet together every Sunday to worship in the morning and then we sing three songs and we pray and we hear announcements and then we hear the word of God and then we go out and our kids are doing worship. And as we do small groups, this systematic approach to God-fearing is good. Leaving a legacy of faith for our children is good. Religion can be pure and undefiled. It's our hearts that take it and make it something that it shouldn't be. I think in the midst of all of this, I think James, there's, there's three conversations happening on for, for James, the speed of life, the mirrors, the religion, but I think they're all talking about something similar going on. And I think, I think if we're to take the bigger picture, not just of James, but of all of scripture, and if we start in a place where we look at this thing and we say, okay, I need to count it all joy when I face trials of many kinds. Okay, check. Okay, I need to be steadfast. Okay, I need to remain steadfast. Got it. Okay, I'm gonna be quick. I'm gonna be the kind of person that's quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to anger. Okay, I got it. I'm, I'm gonna put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. Okay, I'm, I'm going to persevere. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna act. When we start as that is our basis of our understanding of our relationship with God, we will miss so much of the freedom that God has for us. The perfect law as Christ is not you go figure out how to do things better and then come to Jesus. It is Jesus is there waiting for you to be healed, to find life. There's a way where we could read James and we could read it like the Proverbs in the New Testament and say, here's my how-tos of Christian living. And it is, I mean, there is some good truths here we need to live out. But how are we doing, guys? Last week, some of you heard some news, you experienced some things, some trials. How are you doing with that? How many of us already this morning when we were called to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger, we've already messed that one up today. How are we doing with it? I think if we're honest, I think we're being really honest in our hearts, even on our best days with our best attempt and full rest, night of sleep and a full cup of coffee in us, even at our best, we we stink. I think if we're being honest, and in fact, scripture would say so, Paul would say that even our best efforts are as stink to Jesus, to God. Does that mean we are not to act upon these things? No. It is to realize that when we respond to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger, the standard with our ability to live up to it, what we do with the gap of that reveals the problem of our hearts. It reveals who God is to us. It reveals the nature of our being. There's one approach to this where we have the standard, be perfect, therefore, as I am perfect. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. When we hear that, the standard, we can say, oof, I've tried this. I've I can't do it anymore. I've tried so hard to live under this. I've tried so hard to follow after Jesus and I'm tired of feeling guilty every time I come to church. So it's not possible. And so you either bail, leaving all relationship with God in the dust or you just numb your heart to what is there and you just say it can't be done. And so you bend the word to say what you mean to say, well, I can't really mean, can't really mean in all times be quick to listen. It can't really mean Look out for the widows and orphans, all it it can't really mean that. So we bend it. Or we go to the word and we say, oh yeah, watch me. 
look how good I'm gonna be at this. I run a business, I'm successful, I'm strong, I take care of myself. Watch how good I'm gonna do at following the rules. Recovering rule followers, are you with me? Yeah? It's like, it's like you're, you're saying with the gap between our ability to live up to what Christ calls us to and the standard of what he calls us to, we say, watch me do it, watch me. And in the midst of these extremes, Jesus says, come to me, come to me, come to me. My yoke is easy, my burden is light, come to me. For those of you who know me, you know, if you've known me for more than 10 minutes, I like to exercise, I love CrossFit, all that fun stuff. Um, no, this is not a picture of me. Uh, but but uh, there's a word that's used in James often, and I love it. It's one of my fra- favorite Greek words. It's hupomenos. And the idea is to hold up under, to bear underneath weight, to be able to bear with one another, to persevere, to endure. I love it because to me, it just makes me think a lot of uh, weightlifting and things like that. Does the call of Christ and his ways, does that feel light to you? I think when we try to live up to the commands of God with our own strength and putting us as the hero, we're either going to not want to pick up the weight at all or we're going to get buried under its load. It is too much for human hearts to carry. We cannot do this on our own. So if we approach the book of James, if we approach scripture and we say, got it, these are my to-dos to make Jesus happy, we are gonna get buried under the weight. But, good news, good news. We do not have to do that in order to earn favor with God. When we look to him as the achiever of these things, as the perfect fulfillment and model for the things that he calls us to, when we look to starting in a place of looking to him, there's life there, man. There is freedom. When we can agree with God that our sin really is as painful and ugly and nasty as he says it is, that the consequence of that sin is death and condemnation, when we agree with him that he is the only way to rescue and we just decide to cast our old cell off, taking off all the old labels we agreed to, all the lies that we once believed and we take on the new self in Christ Jesus, when we do that, Man, these things are get-tos. They are not have-tos. This is life. This word that we can look intently under and sit under, this becomes living water, not a crushing weight. Stu, last week, he brought us the first chunk of this. I said, count it all joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. And, And he said, if we take our understanding of the reality of this and we're thinking through the way the world thinks that what is material is all there is. We become functional atheists in that way. When we look at this and we hear things like count it all joy, my brothers, when we hear look after widows and orphans, be quick to listen, so to speak. When we hear those things, if apart from the gospel, at best, this is just kitschy, nice religious sayings. Might as well say, be a good person. Apart from the gospel, at best it's that. At worst, it's insulting, it's damning, and it uh, causes injury to people all over the place, to our own hearts, to the relationships between us. But if the gospel is true, and it is, then good news, even when you hated God, he loved you. Good news, even those who are furthest from him, who you think is, has the least chance of knowing Jesus, good news, they're welcome back. Good news, even when Satan or the world or your own choices have buried you under a pile of sin, good news, there's life. Good news, there's a way home. Jesus picks you out, he picks you up, and he brings you home, and he invites you to take that gift and say, yes, I will make you my rescuer and friend. Good news, even when you can't be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, Christ died for you. So then, 
you are welcomed into that relationship with him in order that words like be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger make sense that it's even possible to do those things and not feel like it's a crushing weight that we sit underneath. When we throw ourselves at the feet of Jesus, we put off the old self. You don't have to be that rageaholic that explodes at people anymore. You do not have to be the center of attention that talks so much that no one else has an opportunity to get a word in. You do not have to be that person that just never listens. Good news, under the authority of Christ, through his powers of resurrection, we can be invited to do this. And this is good news. So if we want to live this way, receive Christ as your Lord and Savior right now in your hearts. If you want peace that goes beyond understanding, look to the Prince of Peace for this. Do not think that by doing all these things and achieving all this work, that somehow you are earning that for yourself. It is Christ who gives it to you freely and invites you in to be part of the community that gets to do this together. It's a get to, not a have to, brothers and sisters. For those of you who do not know Christ as Lord and Savior, this becomes a get to and a have to when you accept him. Come to him and he will give you rest. Three conversations pointing to a central truth that God through the perfect law of Christ sets us free and invites us into life and to hope and to freedom. Good news. So what do we do with this good news? We listen and act upon it. We do something about it. We respond to the gospel call. If you have not responded to God's free invitation of life for you, I encourage you, do so now. It doesn't have to be some big special show. It can just be a simple prayer in your heart that says, God, I'm sorry I've wronged you. I'm sorry that I've broken your heart and I'm sorry for all the wrongs I'm continuing to do. But I acknowledge you as the Lord of my life that you have given me rescue through Jesus Christ and no other means and that only through him will I have the power to be able to receive life now and forever. And just through that simple belief in the following of Jesus, you, the rest of this will be possible. And apart from it, you can do nothing. So listen and act upon the gospel. Number two, listen and act upon this text. Do what it says. This is life-giving, brothers and sisters. This is good news. Good news. You do not have to be the center of attention anymore. Good news. You do not have to be the parent that just blows up your kids all the time. And good news, even if you do, There's a dad who loves you and forgives you and wants you to have full relationship through him. Good news. Good news. Act on this text and we are gonna become from one measure of glory to the next, as Paul would say, from one measure of glory to the next, we will be more and more like Jesus to the world around us. He does call us to something here. This is not, I'm not trying to dismiss the call to action. I'm just trying to say when we make ourselves the hero, we got it backwards. So make Christ the hero and then act upon it. And then lastly, listen and act in community. This letter, if you go back to verse one, it's to the 12 tribes. Like he's writing to the dispersed Jewish Christians in the first century. This is probably the earliest letter that we have in all of scripture. And so because of this, this, he's not like printing off 10,000 copies and giving one to Tim and one to Paul and one to Rebecca and one to, no. This is going out through to be read and understood in community. And the thing about mirrors is, the thing about the mirror of the word is that I don't always see myself so good. (laughs) And I don't think you do either. And I don't always understand this. This is my job. I love getting to do this, but I don't always see it clearly. We need each other to be able to sit under this and sit, help it make sense. Uh, Jesus says some pretty hard things. Take up your cross, follow him. Die to yourself. What does this mean? What does this mean in light of my life? This is best done when we are doing this in the community. It stands to reason that to better understand the word, to better understand our own hearts is better to be together. And I wanna invite you into opportunities. We are doing this all across our church from the youngest kids all the way through the oldest. We're offering a community where we can dig into the word together. Uh, Jesus prayed at the end of his life, his last prayer before being on the cross was for us that we all would be one like him and the father are one. And he prayed for us that the word would go out and our love would be known to the world around us. So in our church, we celebrate life together in small communities of small groups where we can come together 
to inwardly care for, know, and love one another. We can be known and present and faithful to each other. And then we experience a vertical relationship in the upward love of God together, where we can be just receiving his love, receiving his truth, and being able to wrestle with that together, where we can worship and pray and fast for one another. And then as a result of all that love pouring down on us and pouring out amongst us, then it pours out to the world around us outside of that group where we can be excited for our global partners to come alongside and pray for them, where we can reach out into our communities and rather than depending on some politician or depending on some community leader to lead the charge, we look at the people of Christ and say, love well, and then the world has changed. In our inward, upward, and outward love, that's what we're here to do, to do life in community, to listen and act together. Normally I would direct you to check out our website, but I'm being told a lot of websites around the world right now are down. And so one, our website's back up, keep checking it. You can find a lot of ways of where you can connect into our church. If you are already connected in, if you feel like you already have that community, I'm so excited for that. Praise God that you have that, that you can sharpen one another under the authority of the word and spirit. But for those of you who don't have that, or maybe you stepped out, now's the time. It's a good day to have a good day together. And we're not perfect, I can guarantee you that. But we can look to each other with forgiveness and repentance, knowing Christ is the hero and we don't have to be. I wanna thank you for being with us this morning. I wanna thank you for sitting under this text together, this word. This is life, you guys. This is love, this is freedom, this is hope. Look intently upon it, receive the word and let it change you. I want to invite you to stand and join me in a closing prayer together. And as we do, my hope always is this, that these are not just words on a screen we're reciting, but actual truths we're getting into our soul to live out today. Let's pray. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. Amen. we praise the one who bore our sins. Let's respond now in a posture of surrender. Sing this with us. You came to the world you created, trading your crown for a cross. You willingly died, your innocent life paid the cost. Counting your status says nothing. The King of all kings came to serve. Washing my feet, covering me with your love. If more of you means less of me, take it. all of you is all I need. Take everything. You are my life and my treasure. Desires and dreams I lay
Father God, thank you so much for just giving us renewed grace every day. Because sometimes in this listening thing, we are a disaster. I know I am, Father, and we all can grow in this area of being more quick to listen, ask questions, learn more before we just start popping off. There's a bunch of people here that already are quiet, a little more timid, sometimes feel taken advantage of because of that. And those of us who are quick to speak need to take note, need to take a step back. But again, thank you so much for the grace to just give us another second chance to learn more in this area. We are so grateful for this time together. We're so grateful for your word this morning. Help us to take it with us this week and actually be active, active listeners in our community, in our families, and with people around us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. If you are here today and you are just feeling something inside that you just need someone to talk to or pray with you, we want you to come forward. Please do not hesitate to do this. Come forward and you will be blessed. You will be heard and you will be loved well. There will be people up in front here that would love to talk with you. Please do it. You are dismissed. Have a wonderful Sunday. Thanks for coming out today.